All right, welcome back everyone. We're here for another show, Q&A on everything about health, nutrition, keto, intermittent fasting. So bring your questions. Anything that I say is not meant to diagnose or replace your medical care. Just check with your um, professional um, physician before implementing any of the things we're gonna talk about. And I'd just like to dive right in, Steve, over to you. As usual. Okay, well, we have, uh, first of all, let's go off with Christy from Baton Rouge. She's pulling the handles of industry. She's a big deal at some grocery store chain, counting all the money. And I hope I didn't bust you with that, uh, Christy. It's awful noisy in there. Let's see. Let no. Get... Okay, there you no, go. No, not at all. All right, one question, 30 seconds, go. Good morning, Dr. Berg. And I just want to start out by saying thank you so very much for all of your time and all of your effort that you put into us. Uh, the main question that I have is, in doing the body type uh, questionnaire, um, I tested more to the ovarian side, but I noticed, though, that my body is changing, unfortunately, into the adrenal side. But I do know that in the years past, I've had insulin resistance to deal with and things like that. I'm not as bad with it now because I have changed my eatings. But my main question is, in transitioning body types, trying to retain what I have, I have lost a lot of my muscle tone already, unfortunately. Is there a recommended vitamin regimen? And I do use um, a decent bit of your products. Um, I also use some oil-based um, supplements as well. And so my question is, is there kind of a, uh, a regimen or things that I need to incorporate in a particular way to get the best results in that body transitioning type, and I'm trying to do the intermittent fasting as well as working into keto. Got it. What, what is your age? I am, oh, 52 this year. Okay. Well, that's exactly where menopause occurs at 52. Right. Um, so what happens when you go through this shift, uh, you have um, this backup uh, organ called the adrenals that are backing up the ovaries because the ovaries are going into retirement right now. Uh, and they produce the same hormones. But if there is additional stress, which probably is not in your case, you're probably completely stress-free, um, then what happens yeah. is that the the raw material to build up those hormones go to the adrenal at the neglect of the ovaries. So now we have this uh, imbalance and uh, because there's nothing left to build up the ovarian hormones. And that, that's when you need the estrogen for bone uh, growth and that type of thing. And plus cortisol in the adrenals is very destructive. It's a catabolic hormone. Um, so uh, what you need to do is um, the most important thing is to, um, you know, do whatever you can <clears throat> to handle the stress, whatever that is, and actively and aggressively um, watch my videos and just, you know, I will give you a lot of advice on that. But the raw material for not just the adrenal hormones, but the other hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, are, are is cholesterol. Okay. So don't be afraid to consume enough butter, egg yolks, animal fats. Like don't go low on that because that's like the raw material to make, because they're all cholesterol-based hormones. So um, <clears throat> the other uh, supplement that might benefit you in small amounts is DHEA. That's another precursor. Okay. So that's another thing that might help you. But, you know, supplements that are geared towards um, adrenal, adaptogens, uh, de a desiccated adrenal, supporting the adrenal is going to be what you need to do. And I have a lot of data on, like, the adrenal body type. Um, okay. So that's kind of what you need to do right now. But, um, yeah, getting that muscle back um, involves sufficient amount of uh, quality protein, eggs being at the top of the list, um, have enough of that. And also the combination of a lot of exercise to stimulate the muscles to prevent that uh, atrophy. The that walking happens. or the hit? Uh, I would do a combination of both because you you also need to um, kind of work the muscle to make it grow or else it just doesn't okay. grow regardless of how much protein you have. Um, okay. But do you want to make sure you have enough protein and it has to be quality. And I, I just actually, I didn't release it, but I just... Um, I have a video coming up that you, I think you'll like that talks about um, protein and going beyond just consuming dietary protein, go on the exercise, what nutrition you need. I think you'll like that. 
uh, just to preserve your muscles as you go, you know, into the, uh, you know, advanced uh, aging process. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be, you're more okay. advanced then. You'll be okay. You Absolutely. Well, Christy, get and do back. I need that dim estrogen or no? Um, I don't, I don't think you need it unless you're estrogen dominant. Uh, but from what you told me, it sounds mm -hmm. like, um, you just need to provide what the adrenals need. So then the, so you, it doesn't steal the hormones from the other, other, other parts of your body. So, cause it's kind of like okay. a, during stress, the body allocates resources to stress at the neglect of other things. So Very good. Well, thank you so much, Christy. Got to move along, but we would love to hear back from you after you uh, complete um, the transition and so on and feel terrific uh, for the rest of your life, etc. Why don't we kick things off with a quiz question now after that great chat with Christy, and there it is. All right, so what is the one and only wheat product that is acceptable for the ketogenic diet? I know everyone likes the bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, and things like that, but what, what, um, What's that one wheat product that you can consume in unlimited amounts and not ever have to worry about it? You've piqued our interest, Dr. Bird. All right. I, I could imagine I piqued your interest for sure, Steve, yeah. right? <laughs> that's right. Do you mean Krispy Kreme donuts are back on the plate? I can't wait to hear. All right, let's see. So uh, anyway, let's find out if there's anyone interested in the show at all. Apparently there are. And let's say hello to our viewers joining us today from UK. Canada, Mexico, Jordan, Oman, the Czech Republic, Ireland, Greece, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Poland, France, Pakistan, Norway, the Virgin Islands, uh, Mar Maritas, uh, thank you, Terry, spell spelling that, Chile, Germany, Sweden, Brazil, Japan, Colombia, Nepal, Israel, Austria, Trinidad and Tobago, Cuba, Iceland, welcome Cuba, Scotland, India, Ethiopia, Switzerland, Ghana, Australia, South Africa, Slovenia, Nigeria, Brunei, Brunei, excuse me, Mongolia, wow, Bangladesh, Autria, uh, the Philippines, Uganda, Belgium, Italy, Armenia, Peru, Finland, Saudi Arabia, North Cyprus, Argentina, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Malaysia, Puerto Rico, what a list, the Dominican Republic, and then, of course, all across these United States of America. So thank you so much, everybody, for listening and making the show a success and making your health a success as a result. That's what we're after here. Uh, let's see, why don't we go over to social media, and Bruce from YouTube wants to know if kombucha is good for us. you gotta, you got to be careful about kombucha because, um, you know, a, a while ago you could find it with like 2 grams of sugar, but nowadays it's like you read the label and like, what's 12 grams of sugar, 16 grams of sugar, that's a lot of sugar because they make it out of sugar, and they make it out of sugar and uh, black tea. So um, I think the um, the acids in there, do help uh, the digestive system. Um, but I think there's some better uh, digestive fermented products. I think there are like kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, but I will say if, if let's say for example, um, you have um, someone of a craving for alcohol, um, kombucha tea is a good alternative because it gives you the texture, it gives you the calmness, and uh, it's kind of like a carbonated beverage that you can pretend like you're drinking a beer and um, create similar effects. So I think for that purpose, that would be good. Okay, very good. Let's go to the first question from this morning. A lot of times they get neglected because they all spin up past me. So I've gone back for your question, Tara, from uh, YouTube. What kind of diet would you recommend for someone with... Um, Pulsatile tinnitus. Since I've started keto, I can hear my heartbeat in my ear. It stopped briefly in February, but Dagnabbit has returned in March. That is a classic uh, potassium deficiency. When you go on keto, you lose a lot of water weight. You lose glycogen. And uh, in the glycogen, which is stored sugar, uh, you have potassium. So that actually goes away. And this is why when I when I recommend doing the ketogenic diet, I, uh, you know, make sure you take the B vitamins, make sure you take your electrolytes, uh, definitely potassium. You need a lot of it. You need like 4,700 milligrams. Very few people know what that means. Uh, they think if they have a banana a day, which is not keto, uh, that'll give them enough. A banana only gives you 300 milligrams. You need 4,700. How many times Steve does 300 
go into 4,700? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. A lot. So you need a lot of potassium to be able to um, kind of just get your RDAs. Um, and so, you know, big salads, vegetables, things like that. Um, you can get potassium from other, from meat products too. Um, but the point is that, um, I think with a little extra potassium, um, you will, that, uh, pulse pulsing in the ear will go away. Okay. Sharing from YouTube, when you are in ketosis, does the body stay in ketosis? Should your keto strips always indicate that you're in ketosis? Well, if your keto strips are saying you're in ketosis, you're in ketosis. Um, but what happens, it's like, um, it's an either or either you're burning carbs or you're being sugar. Now there's 10 of degrees of this, but it's, it, there's, a, a little carb, which basically triggers insulin will knock you out of key. It just like switches right back to sugar metabolism. So you're not going to be burning fat very much at all. So, um, the point is that that's why, um, the secret to this whole thing of staying in ketosis is, is lowering carbs. Um, that is the, the single thing that you have to focus on. So the body will do um, a kind of, as a priority, it, it wants to regulate sugar. And so um, it wants to keep the sugar normal. That's kind of like the stable point that everything revolves around. So, um, you, you know, if you, if your carbs are a little too high, you're no longer in ketosis. Um, it should show up in your urine. Um, I think urine tests uh, are some t- are good in the beginning, but not later because once you adapt to ketosis, you're going to be more efficient. You're going to burn up these ketones, right? If you're burning up ketones, are you going to have any extra in your urine? No, because you're burning them up. So all of a sudden it doesn't show up in the urine. You think, oh my gosh, I'm not in ketosis. A better thing to do is to check your blood. That would be a better way to know if you're really in ketosis or not. All right. Very good. Well, uh, we asked the question, what is the one and only wheat product that is acceptable to the ketogenic diet? And I'm disappointed that not one person said six Krispy Kreme donuts. Instead, 90% of our respondents say it is wheatgrass and the other 10% say it's sprouts. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a product that doesn't really resemble a bread, but it's, uh, the, the, when you sprout the wheat, um, it's still wheat, right? It's the plant. It's not the grain. The grain is how they make the flour and then the breads. So when you sprout um, wheat grain, you uh, and you capture it before it grows too high, it doesn't have any grains in it. So there's no gluten. There's no. There's very little, if any, oxalates. Maybe there's a tiny bit, but there's not much. Um, there's going to be um, lower levels, if any, of phytates or phytic acid. So, so you get rid of all the bad stuff and then the gluten, there's no gluten in it because there's no grains developing. The grains happen later in that plant's life. So, wow, that's, you get all the benefits of this uh, wonderful grass, but without the bad stuff. Now that grass is um, 70% of its chlorophyll. Chlorophyll actually has the ability to make red blood cells because it's identical to your own blood except for manganese. Blood is iron, chlorophyll is manganese. So you can actually stimulate blood. There's also other properties in this uh, wheatgrass that increase white blood cells and thrombocytes, which help you help you clotting. So there's this condition called thalassemia, which is a genetic thing where you're very, very anemic. And um, unfortunately, like the only treatment is like bone marrow transplant and uh, maybe blood transplant plant, but they're using wheatgrass to help that condition. And it seems to be helping these, uh, help these people. So if there's anything um, going on with the blood, especially in the anemia area, I think chlorophyll is a really good, good thing. So the, on the flip side, when you have the wheat, it literally destroys the lining of the colon. Okay. Destroys the lining of your colon, leaky gut, gives you all sorts of problems, even like Hashimoto's, things like that. But then the wheatgrass juice can actually heal the inside of the colon because it doesn't have gluten and it has things that can actually support the lining of the colon. So anyway, I think it's very, very interesting. But of course, it doesn't taste the same, does it, Steve? 
Yeah, it As certainly does. I would go bread out of the oven with the butter. It just doesn't taste the same. <laughs> it certainly doesn't, but I'll tell you what else isn't the same is everyone, you, when you go to the colonoscopy, the, the, uh, what's the name? Uh, you had right. You had a uh, colonoscopy. They say you have diverticulitis. It's almost a given that someone has it. However, I just heard from a guy who his uh, colon uh, perforated from diverticulitis, and he almost died. I mean, it is a serious problem when it goes on uh, to a degree where it gets really bad. So even though it's so common coming out of that, beware, that's not a good condition to have in its uh, extent. So therefore, my diet uh, that I wish I could do but can't uh, is not recommended. So let's see. How about... Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so Athena from YouTube uh, w wants to know, what diet supplements do you recommend for someone with celiac disease, speaking of the colon? Well, celiac comes from that um, that gluten thing, right? So the diet you need to be on is a no-grain diet. And I would actually probably get off all fibers and go on the, the carnivore for a while because... Um, you won't be able to tolerate very many fibers because there's all this inflammation going on in the gut. So um, that being said, one thing that you potentially could do is juice cabbage and have the cabbage juice. Uh, it has uh, really interesting properties for in, on many different levels to heal uh, ulcers in the digestive system, reduce inflammation, and I did a video on it. So uh, cabbage juice is what I would recommend. Okay, very good. And let's continue with our shout out uh, to some uh, latecomers in Spain, Romania, Jamaica, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan, Somalia, uh, Nambia, Hong Kong, Haiti, and Madagascar. Boy, they are all over the place. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, let's see, what can we do next? Okay, we're, uh, why don't we go with another question, Doc? All right, which nutrient deficiency leaves you with those little white dots and lines on your nails? Like the white horizontal kind of uh, lines. They could be kind of thicker too, but what nutrient deficiency will give you those? Okay, very good. While we're waiting for that answer, why don't we go to Carolyn from New Jersey and, oh, my goodness, she just popped off. Let's try uh, instead Samir, uh, and he is uh, from Toronto, your old haunt. Samir, you're on with Dr. Berg. Hello. Hello, Dr. Berg. Thank you so much for everything you do. You've really been a lifesaver. And, uh, you know, just this is my second time on. So uh, my question this time is a little bit more serious yeah. than... Uh, can, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. My, Go ahead. Say that again. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, basically my question is, um, my father-in-law, he had an ischemic stroke uh, about three weeks ago. He's uh, 75 years old. He does, doesn't have any other, like he doesn't have diabetes, but he does suffer from hypertension. Um, so after the stroke, he's been left sort of almost paralyzed on his left side of the body. So now, I mean, uh, we've been having difficulty keeping his blood pressure under control as well. Uh, the good thing is I gave him some of your electrolytes, and apparently that had a very good effect in lowering his blood pressure for a few days. I think going forward, my question is, what's the best thing we can give him, and or what's the best thing he can do to recover from, from this episode? So what I would do uh, in that situation is I would, well, of course, hopefully he's on the ketogenic diet, the healthy version, and doing intermittent fasting. But the other thing I would do is I would... Um, Start, start him on tocotrienols that will actually help the circulation in the vascular system in his brain and all of through the arteries. Um, I would also recommend methylene blue, 40, 40 drops a day in water. Probably put it with electrolytes because it doesn't taste that great. But the methylene blue um, is fascinating. It works deep in the, um, the brain cells and other cells in the mitochondria. They give it oxygen. In fact, it's one of the remedies that uh, doctors recommend if you have a stroke because it just actually helps to repair the damaged uh, cells and neurons and bypass the damaged cells and just give it oxygen. And it's like a sponge. It just kind of cleans up a lot of um, things that are creating problems um, without giving you too many big words. Uh, I would also... Um, 
you know, um, let's see, vitamin E, which is a form of cocaine, methylene blue, and uh, garlic. Garlic also anti-thrombosis, um, and then the ketogenic diet. Uh, that's what I would do, and um, and also he's already taking the potassium for the blood pressure, but then vitamin D also for the blood pressure. I'm, I'm, so many people are deficient in vitamin D that um, that's another thing that can keep the pressure high. But vitamin D is like a natural, it's one of the best natural anti-inflammatories. So that's a really good one too. So Dr. Berger, just on the tocotrinos front, um, that's one thing I really wanted to give him, but there's always, I read warnings that you cannot use tocotrinos with other blood thinners. So is that an issue or? You just have to work that out with your doctor. I can't tell you yes or no, but it does thin the blood, but it's, it's not, um, it's not a synthetic thing, right? So it, um, it does thin the blood. It prevents thrombrosis, th thrombrosis, but it doesn't, it's not going to go to the extreme. Uh, and it's also not going to create internal bleeding, uh, but it has a lot of other effects for the inside of the vascular system to help pr protect against um, all sorts of uh, damage. It's one of the most, it's one of the best antioxidants for the vascular system. That's why I like it. But check with your doc to see if you could take it. But um, but I do understand the situation, I'm trying to work with the doctor that will allow you to do natural things. Sometimes they just don't understand it. So you have to educate them and uh, hopefully they're open-minded <clears throat> to try new things. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Dr. Berg, once again. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, thanks, Samir. And we're all uh, uh, pulling for your, I guess it was your father or father-in-law, whoever, <clears throat> but that's a terrible thing to have, and we hope that all is well. We'd love to hear back from him again about his, uh, hopefully, his uh, great recovery. Okay, Dr. Berg, we have an astute audience, as always. And quiz question number two asks, which nutrition nutrient deficiency leaves you with those little annoying white dots on your nails, and the audience has an answer. 65% of our respondents say it's zinc, 20% say it's calcium, 10% say it's B1, and the remaining 5% say it's vitamin C. They're all over the place, Doc. Let's reel them in. It's zinc, ah. zinc. If you're deficient in zinc, you have these little white specks, and um, what usually causes a deficiency of zinc is those refined carbs and sugar, right? Or alcohol, or even stress. But um, yeah, so you have those white little specks. And um, another interesting thing about the nails um, with the zinc deficiency is you'll get this little in infection or swollen uh, red cuticle. If you ever see that, that's the zinc deficiency. Um, you know, people tend to think of a zinc deficiency, you lose your sense of smell, but you also lose your sense of tasting flavors. Everything is bland. You can't really differentiate flavors. Uh, and even sometimes the flavors become bitter, um, like metallic or like a chemical. And so it really ruins your ability to, to experience food, which is really bad. So, um, Steve, question, if you, if you, um, if you knew long, no longer could taste food or differentiate flavors, wouldn't that be a problem? I mean, especially, or it might be a good thing to avoid then junk food, right? Oh, it'd be a blessing in my case, I can tell you that. <laughs> Just bring on the cardboard flavor, I'll take it. Everything tastes like cardboard. Boy, you, you'd probably start eating healthy. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see. Why don't we just whiz through these questions? They're so exciting. Uh, here's a true falser. Now, by the way, 65% of the last ones were very smart. The rest of you, I'm gonna give you a, a chance to redeem yourself because this one's 50-50. All right, true or false, it takes carbon dioxide to allow oxygen to enter your cells. And that seems counterintuitive, but let's see what the audience says on that one. Okay, and let's go back to social media. I have neglected them for a few minutes. Uh, Yesen Yesenia from YouTube, why would blood pressure drop? Oh, this is, well, why would blood pressure drop all of a sudden? She doesn't give me any more detail, but is there make anything of that um well maybe maybe you stopped eating salt i don't i don't know um but it can also drop if you have weak adrenals too um, um in fact one of the tests to determine like adrenal strength is called raglan's test which when you stand up 
quickly or you stand up and your blood pressure goes down. It should go up, goes down and you're like, wow, I feel really dizzy. Um, but that's more like a, a temporary thing. But typically if it's like just low blood pressure, it could be that you're not drinking enough fluids or you're not having enough salt. Um, so you need more blood. So, um, don't be afraid to have more sea salt. Very good. Hope that helps. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Farmer John from YouTube, Dr. Berg, why does eating grapefruit uh, the only thing that stops my GERD? There are um, some phytonutrients in grapefruit that um, are actually really good for your digestive system. Um, and they're a bit like a kind of an antacid type thing. And so there's definitely something in there. Um, I think you might experience the same thing in either broccoli sprouts or cabbage um, because it's uh, there's there's some things in there that actually help the digestive system. But I recently did a video on GERD and um, that gives you a, a better understanding of what's behind GERD and um, to correct it rather than just try to, you know, take something to mitigate the symptoms. Um, GERD typically is associated with... Um, a valve problem, which is also associated with a, the stomach acid not being strong enough. So having enough stomach acid by taking betaine hydrochloride can potentially even correct that. So watch my videos on that and see if that doesn't give you some ideas. All right. Very good. We're going to go back. We've had Shamali on once. She's, um, I think, from the UK. And Shamali, you're kind of noisy there, but go ahead with your one question and let's hear it in 30 seconds. Uh, stand by, and you're on with Dr. Bird. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Thank you so much for having us and uh, making the world healthy, uh, which is really good. Um, I uh, I have been diagnosed with uh, alpha one anti anti trypsin deficiency in my liver. Uh, it's about um, uh, the. The, the consultant said that it's been having with me for, since I was born, but I found out last November, last year. And also I have fatty liver. And then I was asked to get um, spirometry test, which came out really good, as well as the liver ultrasound, which uh, we, I got the results two days ago. And uh, it was looking good, but I'm not too sure about well, what to do, what to eat and everything. But I, I've been listening to a lot of um, videos of yours. And then I started taking um, some supplements from you. And I'm following the keto and uh, I'm doing the um, uh, fasting as well. Not every day, but four to five days a week. Uh, but since last month, um, I... Uh, having um, uh, a right shoulder pain every morning, but I change everything like mattress and the pillows. It won't go away. I just want to find out some about the uh, alpha one and gypsum deficiency. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely some um, some some problems in the liver with. Uh, with fats. And so you probably are going to benefit from choline, choline in the diet on a regular basis, which is going to help, help you with the, with kind of those little ducts, uh, drainage, they're little tubes uh, from your liver to your gallbladder. And so drain that out a bit. And then, uh, you'll probably benefit from uh, some, uh, bile salts as well. Um, okay. that will help. And, um, and then see what happens because that just might be enough to get rid of that shoulder pain. But the shoulder pain is a, an indicator that the, you still have a problem in that area. So I had that for 12 years. Um, but another thing you could take just if you really wanted to go that one step further is a, an additional type of bile salt called Tutka. Okay. And uh, you take that uh, between meals. So you take the bile salts with meals after the meal and then Tutka um, in between the meals, like maybe two and then two, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and then see if that doesn't open up that duct. Um, okay. And then what will happen is um, watch my videos on the gallbladder flushing. It's a manual kind of a visceral massage that you can massage that area that, that will also help 
as well. Absolutely. But uh, that's that. Those are some tips that I would recommend. I'm taking the gallbladder formula about okay, two days. Good. Is it good? Okay. That's good. Yeah, you're on the right track. Um, and uh, let's let's see if these additional recommendations uh, resolve that. And um, yeah, it's really the, the liver is all about digesting fats, so we just need to tweak that a little bit. It sounds great. We'll get back with this, Shamali. We hope uh, that is uh, some great counsel and that you feel better. All right, let's see. Let's uh, see if we have some answers here. Oh, we certainly do. Okay, so quiz question number three, uh, the audience did not ignore, and it asks, true, false. Uh, it takes CO2 to allow oxygen into your cells, and 82% of our respondents say it's true. 18% say no way, it's false. It's a true statement, and um, this is why when you're hyperventilating, you can't get oxygen. And this is why they, you want to breathe in a paper bag, and all of a sudden you can breathe better. Interesting. So, um, so um, even high altitudes, there's a pressure involved. There's more pressure up there. And uh, initially you have to adapt to it, but once you adapt to it, they found that people that live in high altitudes live a little longer than people that don't because of um, <clears throat> there's um, there's definitely uh, you get more oxygen uh, even though there's less air <laughs> you get more oxygen deeper into the cells due to the CO2. So what does this mean? It means that um, for stress, for panic attacks, for asthma, for exercise, if you can start breathing through your nose, it seems like you're restricting your air, but you're increasing your CO2 to get more O2. So uh, CO2 is not just a waste product. It's um, something that's necessary to keep the blood at the right pH, uh, that acidity level, so the oxygen can go in. This is why if you had pure oxygen therapy, uh, it, there's a lot of side effects from that. Pure oxygen therapy. To get more oxygen, you can't, it won't work. It goes in the blood, but it doesn't go in your cells. Now, <clears throat> this also relates to um, cancer too, because um, what really happens deep inside the, the energy factory of the cell, which is there's oxygen involved, um, it becomes hypoxic. And then that apparently triggers the switch to go from a normal cell to an abnormal cell. Now, this doesn't necessarily relate to what I just said, but it's just an interesting phenomenon that our our bodies uh, need CO2 um, just as much as oxygen. So when you slow down your breath and you equalize the inhalation with the exhalation, then you can you can breathe better. So especially if you're trying to go to sleep at night or you're going through stress, the breathing is uh, something you can control. All right, very good. We lost uh, Carolyn, but now she is back, thank goodness, uh, from... New Jersey, let me unmute you. And if you'll unmute yourself, Carolyn, you're on with Dr. Bird. Well, my cortisol level is so high because I'm freaking out trying to get back online. <laughs> 10 minutes. You made oh it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I love you. I love you. Real quick, 61 years old, have Hashimoto. I have HPV. Um, I used to be diabetic. I used to be heavier. Anyway, I'm a year in, 52, town, 52 pounds lost, and sometimes I wake up in the morning and my my sugar is like 89, and that freaks me out. That's one thing. In 30 seconds, I got three questions. Another thing is um, I love sunflower seeds. I'm on two meals a day, and I love to eat sunflower seeds, which is good for selenium, I guess, right? But anyway, I went to get my blood work done. My cholesterol is real high. And my doctors don't want to hear about keto. They don't want to hear about uh, large buoyant particles. They could care less. They won't take me off my blood pressure medication. Um, so I'm a little freaked out because the doctor said, you know, you're at high risk for a stroke and heart disease. And I'm doing everything. I'm doing um, citrus, bergamot, uh, red yeast, tocinetrols. I go back in three months. I exercise more, and I'm trying not to eat cream cheese and, and big cheeses. Um, anyway, what do you think? Am I going to make it? I think you're going to make it. Um, the Thank the you. first question, the first question um, that you had, 
Okay. About so the blood can... sugar being low. Yeah. So, so just realize that like you're concerned because that's low. Cause I was hypoglycemic and I get all freaked out when it's under, sometimes it's 78. Yeah. So, so you're probably not eating a lot of sugar, correct? I don't eat, I'm clean keto. And okay, I good. fast. So, oh, yeah. so then the question is, where is that sugar coming from? It's not coming from the diet, right? Coming so your from my actually, body. It's coming from my body. Yeah, your body will make whatever ever it needs if you don't eat sugar. So there's always going to be a production. It's called gluconeogenesis. But here's the thing you don't have to worry about. When you don't eat sugar, the blood sugar will come down, sometimes even in the 60s. Oh, I shouldn't freak out if it's under 70? No, you shouldn't freak out because okay. that's your new normal. Okay. That's your new normal and no worries okay. on that. And then the second question is this Hashimoto's thing, which you, uh, selenium is a good, good uh, remedy for that. Um, but you said your cholesterol. I, honestly, I think the best thing to do to reduce your stress is to find a keto friendly or educated doctor because they, you need someone on your team that is up on the research and they're not so narrow minded uh, about this whole cholesterol thing that it's brainwashed everyone. And uh, unfortunately, the more educated someone is, the more sometimes educated in the wrong thing, and they can't even think anymore. So um, you want a doctor with that can have a new viewpoint and to actually look at a research and go, wow, let's try something different. Um, I just want to tell you, I also have diabetic retinopathy and I have to get injections in my eyes and that's getting better. But every doctor I go to, the gynecologist for the HPV, the regular primary care and my eye doctor, they don't want to hear that my lifestyle is making everything better. They don't want to hear, they don't listen. Yeah, you know? that's why you have to get in. That's what you have to, you have, your job needs to be find some doctors that can really work with you on this because right. um, you don't want to p have those guys stressing you out. Um, the other thing is um, if you have enough, um, you know, antioxidants like from sprouts in your salad, those antioxidants are going to um, help the collateral damage from um, that's happening in the eyes. So with the retina um, and you know, I used what, to be diabetic, but I reversed that. And that's, that's why awesome. Yeah, the, 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 um, the trace mineral that's zinc is really concentrated in the retina. And so if you're deficient in zinc, you could even have night blindness, just, just as much as vitamin A. So as long as you're getting all the nutrition and you're doing all the right things, I think your biggest stress is just from doctors trying to push more drugs on you. So They won't take me off my meds. I'm on blood pressure medication, Synthroid, and gout, and I occasionally take a Xanax because I'm so freaked out by all this. I'm not proud of that. So but, what, um, about, what about finding a, um, a cardiologist who uh, does that supports keto? There's a lot of them. And you I'm going to have to look. Yeah. Look it up. It's just look online. I, I have some friends that are cardiologists They're They're, they're heart surgeons and they basically, um, will give you some really good advice and you can work with them remotely possibly, or find someone in your area. But, uh, the point is that, um, you know, when you're getting consulting from someone in an area, um, you want someone that is, um, competent and that has all of the Information, information not on the that plate Dr. Anymore. Berg has. I also mention your name to every doctor I go to, and they look at me like I have five heads, and I'm like, whatever, you know? Can I just tell you that my triglycerides were only 109? And isn't that wow. a good marker, right? That that's is not really bad. good. That's yeah. like, that's really amazing. That's really good. But they don't care because the ratio is 4.0, and the LDL is 249 and the total is 331 and nobody, you know, I, I got scared by those high numbers. Well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, let's say you're a, a carnivore, you're on the carnivore diet and you're going on uh, going to a doctor who is a vegan. What are they going to recommend? Are they going to ever support your diet? No. So, um, you got to choose your doctors wisely. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much for coming on with us. We appreciate it. We would love to hear back from you. Sunflower seeds are fine. Sunflower seeds are fine. You'll get a good amount of vitamin B1 too. So um, I think you're good on that. That's great. All right. Thank you so much, Carolyn. We, have, we would love to hear back from you. And we appreciate now, having Steve, you. You said all of the uh, speakers were going to give one question. And so. I know, I but know. she's so, so entertaining. Funny, though. It's never, 
it doesn't matter. It's just no. they, they, there's a lot of questions people I have. I know, but so. she's yeah, we we're so charmed with her. We're glad to have had you on there. But anyway, get us back. And next time I want a description in 30 seconds because it's all going to be great news. That's terrific. All right, let's see. Let's move on to um, the next question. And Dr. Berg, this is not a true falser. So you audience, you're going to have to dig in. All right, so when is the worst time to drink lemon water or lemon juice? All right, audience, climb on that. Let's see, uh, Jolene from YouTube, my doctor told me that too much vitamin D can cause a fatty liver. Is that true? No, that's not true. No, too much vitamin D, and, and I, I would probably... What is too much? Too much would be like hundreds of thousands of IUs for months and months and months that would be maybe that could potentially create one problem which is hypercalcemia which could relate to skinny kidney stones but if you but it's so so rare so rare um i mean look at then the flip side what are the dangers of not having enough vitamin d oh my goodness viral infections that are have a high risk of um, creating a lot of negative effects uh, inflammation. Um, I mean, there's so many bad things that are connected with the vitamin D deficiency. So, so when you increase it, uh, you're, you're concerned about a toxic effect. It's the only, only one. It's not a fatty liver. It's, uh, it's hypercalcemia. Okay. Uh, Jenna from YouTube, why would someone have high levels of B6 when they are not supplementing it? Well, it's hidden in, uh, different, um, foods um it's also because they put it as a synthetic like um the kind that is um that can accumulate in different foods like enriched enriched or fortified foods it's also in like the fortified um nutritional yeast which i don't recommend so so that's kind of where you you can get it as well and even though you're not taking a supplements and a lot of protein powders too they put that b6 that the way that um um you handle that is to take a natural B6, which is um, it's called P5P, because the synthetic one and that one kind of competes with each other, so it ends up creating a deficiency. So you could have like way too much synthetic B6 and create a deficiency of B6. It's weird because you need the natural one. All right, very good. Let's see here. Um, ooh. Uh, Jeff has nail fungus, poor guy. Uh, can you recommend any dietary changes to address this? Well, you can use the topical um, iodine works good. Tea tree oil works good. Um, but this tells us that your, um, your microbiome needs to be bolstered and strengthened using probiotic foods uh, like um, cow, um, sauerkraut or kimchi, kefir, something like that. But also garlic as a natural antibiotic can help you. And oregano oil is also good. Um, but yeah, so there's definitely a... And then, of course, the yeast, fungus, uh, candida love carbs. So it could mean potentially that your carbs are just too high. All right, very good. Okay, so quiz question number four asks, when is the worst time to drink water or lemon juice? And I drink it at night, so I hope that's not bad. Uh, the audience feels 75% say it's evenings or before bedtime. 20% say first thing in the morning, a complete opposite. 5% say before or after brushing your teeth. Doc, I'm dying to know. Well, the worst time to take it is right before you eat <clears throat> because um, lemon water or lime water, um, it turns into an alkaline substance so it can dilute some of the acidity that you need to digest food so you want to have your lemon water maybe a half hour or earlier before you eat or an hour after you eat just to help your digestive system especially if you're weak on the stomach acid even though lemon juice is an acid like citric acid it all it actually turns alkaline after it goes in your body so that's just a side note of course too you know it's, it's a really strong pH. I think it's like a two. Straight lemon juice is like two. That's like battery acid. So don't you don't want to mouth, mouth, mouthwash with lemon juice. Wow. Uh, you know, I do drink it at night to stave off my hunger. 
uh, I might as well ask you this. It, there are some calories in lemon juice. I use one and a half lemons. Is that uh, going to break my fast, so to speak? Or No, no. But if you just um, maybe dilute it with water and then you suck, suck it with a straw. Oh, no, um, I, I do do it with better. water. I make lemonade. So, but yeah, one and a half lemons. Perfect. All right, very good. Glad to hear it. Okay, let's see now. Oh, why don't we go back to... Uh, I tell you what, let's knock out our last participant. Fur, are you there in Toronto, Cal uh, Canada? Here she comes. Fur, can you hear us? Oh, there she's popping up, but I can't hear you. Fur, are you muted? Unmute yourself, dear. She's working on it. Okay, say something. No, we can't hmm. hear you yet. For you, keep working on that, and we will we will get back to you. So stand by just a minute. Nope, still don't have it. Let's go back to social media. Um, okay, uh, Rakid from YouTube. What are your thoughts about taking creatine like a protein? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I mean, people. People take it to actually support their muscular system, uh, for sure. Uh, if they're lifting weights and exercising, it's uh, it's helpful. I'm not against it. Um, try it, see if it helps you. Um, I'm kind of neutral on that. Um, if you get your amino acids, or you you get, um, if you look at all the things that can stimulate muscle growth, there's a lot of things um, that you can take. Uh, the question is, um, what's going to create an effect? I'm like a human guinea pig. I will buy every supplement. I will try everything in my body. And I would say probably 95% of all the things I get, I have I, like nothing, no, nothing, no response. And also, you know, I also have a group of people that are also helping me with the testing. And I'll, I'll say, hey, try this, try this, try this. And and kind of do my own little um, intel and see if that works or not. But, um, you know, you, you can't always wait for the studies, the research to do a study on something to determine if it's going to work or not, because who's going to fund a study? Studies are expensive. And so unless someone's making money on it, they're not usually going to do a study. Interesting. Well, who can blame them? All right. Final question for the day, audience. Here you go. All right. So, what is the most common nutritional deficiency behind vertigo? Nasty. That's condition. a situation where, and I'm talking about the type that you stand up and you, you're whirling, you're spinning. That's nasty. All right, audience, leap on that. Our final question for the day. Uh, let's see. Okay, Seema Chopra from YouTube. Which supplements do you absolutely recommend is essential for? Good health. Is there like a handful that you should always do, Doc? Well, I think the most important is the vitamin D because it's hard to get it from the diet. Impossible unless you get it from the sun. So vitamin D3 is a really important. That's number one. Uh, and then B1 is really important too for so many different reasons. Um, and of course, you know, um, a third one is potassium. Those are three, but you can get that in electrolyte type things. So um, those are the three like bare essential ones that I think would be really good. But then, you know, you can keep going too. like zinc's important with the trace minerals. And there's a new um, um, remedy that I'm really liking. Um, and I can't find hardly anything bad about it. It's that uh, methylene blue and what it can do for um, kind of mopping up some of the, the destructive things going on in the cell. And uh, it's really interesting what it can do for um, your brain cells and even cancer or even preventing cancer. Uh, I will release a video on the simplicity of what it does, uh, but it's it, it was the first drug ever created. and um, But of course, it's you can't patent it now, so you can get it anywhere, but it uh, has some fascinating effects from something that's synthetic. I'm just like impressed with what it can do. And um, I won't I'll, I'll let you watch the video to get all the details, but it's a fascinating molecule that um, will turn your urine green. Okay. Give us, give us that so name that again. Way, what was it? That way your spouse can detect Steve. If, uh, if you're making it into the toilet. Oh yes, absolutely. And what was the name of that? Um, 
Compound Methylene again? Methylene blue. All right. Well, I'll look it up. Okay, uh, Janice from YouTube. What's the best way to lower blood pressure naturally? My sister has tried a variety of meds and none of them are working. Help. The first thing is getting on the keto because that softens the arteries versus a higher carb, which tends to, especially where fine carbs are going to harden arteries. And then vitamin D is behind a lot of uh, problems with high um, blood pressure, but also a lack of potassium. So potassium will also soften a stiffened artery and help with blood pressure. Um, so those are the three things that are the low hanging fruit that tend to help the majority of people, but there's other things too, which, uh, like magnesium, things like that. But, um, I, I have videos on all these things. Okay. Here's an interesting moniker too lit. Uh, let's see. It just jumped away from me. Um, Oh, here we go. I'm having a lot of sugar level functions while, uh, fluctuation, excuse me, while fasting. Is this normal? When you, when you, um, first do it, it is normal because you're adapting, right? And if your carbs aren't low enough, it'll take you longer to adapt. But in the adapting phase, you're going to be kind of like craving, hungry, and things like that. But after three days, like you should be, the way that you know that it's working is you have no more appetite. Like, wow, I can go longer without being hungry, a lot longer. And you, you get rid of the cravings. Then it makes it really easy to do. Um, but like, even let me ask you, Steve, uh, when you started to do this intermittent fasting, uh, was it overnight or did it take you a while to get to the point where your, your hunger goes away? No, it absolutely goes away. I have not eaten today and I won't till about three or four o'clock first meal. And it's a miracle, a miracle because I was addicted to it. I thought about food from the moment I woke up before because I was started eating it. So it does take a while. But even for someone who is incredibly undisciplined or passionate about, you know, getting something to jack them up, I can tell you that it's worth the wait. I have absolutely no notion to eat until my first meal. After that, I'll admit, once I kick that off in the evening, I have to be a little thoughtful, thus the lemonade and, you know, stuff like that. But it's so, so worth it. How, how long did it take you to get your body to get rid of the, the hunger? Well, I'd say Was it a week, two yeah, weeks? maybe, but the main thing for me is psychological to the point where I didn't even think about it. It wasn't something I have to stave off. It was probably a few months, but before that it got okay. easier. So yes, the, the initial sort of absolute sugar craving goes or cravings go away rather quickly, but for you to completely be numb to it takes a while. And boy, is that a blessing. So Steve, so that, so you have um, the actual body's craving or hunger, but then you have the memory of it, right? That That's habit. Right. That's right. So the question is, how long does it take to get rid of a bad habit? That's the big question, Steve. Well, I guess, you Three know, days? Uh, nah, no. I'm going to say it takes a longer, <laughs> but you know, a few weeks, but I'm just telling you, just stick with it because it will completely go away. And it's the most glorious uh, blessing to not crave that because I just, I mean, I'm down a lot of pounds because of that. Uh, and I, I have to admit audience, I'm not the best on the keto necessarily, although I've cut my carbs back, but intermittent fasting is a blast. Down comes the weight. Wow. All right. Let's see if I got, um, answers yet. Oh yes. Oh no, that's quiz question number three. Come on, Terry, give me some answers on that last question. All right, in the meantime, let's go back. Oh, by the way, Fur, we're so upset that we can't hear you. Try that once more. You know, we want to get you on the air. If not, I'm going to ask them to look for Fur from Toronto next week. I want you to reapply and see if we can't get you on there. If we can't hear you this week, it's so awful because we're running out of time. Now, let's see. Um, Okay, here's some more ringing in the ears. Is ringing in the ears caused by vitamin deficiency? And could it lead to memory loss? I don't know where, she, where that came from. Um, can, can vitamin deficiency lead to memory loss? Is that what you're saying? Uh, 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 yes, and also ringing in the ears was the first comment. Well, um, the, the hippocampus, which is basically... Um, the part of the brain that is involved with uh, the memory loss um, is something that is um, very susceptible to a B1 deficiency. So B1 deficiency. And it is true that B1 deficiency can also affect your hearing too. And if I don't know if it can create 
ringing the ears or not, but it definitely affects the ears. Um, but um, the hippocampus needs uh, B1. It also needs vitamin D and it needs zinc. So those three things are really important um, for your memory. But uh, realize too that um, the ketogenic diet uh, might just be the answer that you're looking for because it it puts in the basic thing that you basic um, fuel that you need to resolve so many additional problems. So it's really hard to answer a specific symptom if I don't know your history and things like that. But I would start with the ketogenic diet, and that way you won't create more deficiencies, like the high carb diet does. All right, very good. So uh, question number five was, what is the most common nutritional deficiency behind vertigo? And Terry, our producer who never makes clerical errors, called it answer for number three. So Terry, I forgive you, but this is actually for five. And for vertigo, 50% of our respondents say it's vitamin B1, 20% say it's B6, 10% say it's B12, 10% say it's potassium, and 10% say it's zinc. They're all over the place, Doc. Any winners? No, we don't have any winners in this one. It's vitamin D. Oh. When you're deficient in vitamin D, you'll tend to uh, develop uh, um, calcium formations too because um, think about this. Vitamin D is all about the absorption of calcium. And if you get this floating calcium that's in your lymph in the inner uh, ear uh, and it's kind of uh, messing with the little hairs that allow you to keep equilibrium, um, which is actually very common, um, the antidote to that is vitamin D. It'll help break it down. Of course, I'm also going to recommend K2 with that, both of them, but um, there's a high level of vitamin D deficiency um, with people with vertigo. Now, there's other causes of vertigo too, but the calcium deposit is actually very, very common. And I will, I'll release a video on that. So you can, there's a, there's a procedure that you can do to see what ear is involved, and then hopefully even to dislodge it out of that inner canal, but ultimately to dissolve it, to prevent it from coming back to vitamin D is something I would recommend. And, mm -hmm. I, and I have a lot of references on this topic, so that way um, you, can, you can read those further too to get that data. Oh my God, audience, 100% wrong. How are you going to get through the weekend with this stain on your reputation? We're going to give you a chance next Friday to redeem yourself. You've been so good. But oh, nobody got vitamin D. Neither did I. So I'm with you, audience. Okay, let's see. Uh, Reese from YouTube, I have Baker cysts on the main artery behind my knees, and I'm told they can't be removed. It's very painful even to walk now. Please share any advice uh, you could to treat them. And she thanks you. In, in practice, um, every, every single person coming with a Baker cyst always had uh, higher blood glucose levels. So, um, and it could also be from, like I had one person that said, she said that she, I'm on a low carb diet and I come to find out she drinks like a bottle of wine a night. I said, oh, did you think that was low carb? Um, so Yes, this, I would get on keto and see if uh, that problem doesn't disappear. But apparently those baker cysts are, are, uh, tend to be associated with a higher blood glucose level. Okay, very good. Let's w wrap up with something cool. Ladies Legacy Gin. I guess that's a type of gin, and that's what this uh, person is calling themselves. Dr. Berg, my husband and I think you're awesome. You are direct and extremely informative. Thank you with a number of exclamation marks. So thanks for that comment. And that's echoed throughout. I don't spend a lot of time uh, with those because we want to answer your questions, but they're out there, and I know Dr. Berg appreciates it um, as you appreciate his great counsel. Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess we have a few seconds. We could remind people to um, you know, get your wonderful app so that they can have all these videos organized and at their fingertips. And then uh, also we have you know, uh, constantly trying to make products available internationally. Any news on that front, Dr. Berg? Well, just check down below to see if they're available. We're always trying to lower the shipping rate on some of these products. So um, we're, we're always working on that actively and aggressively. Um, so just uh, keep checking down below and maybe, maybe um, we're in your area. But um, I know it does take a long time to ship all this stuff. 
Um, on that note, um, I th thank you for sticking around this long. I appreciate all of your wonderful comments and your uh, questions and hope, hope, Hope you're liking these videos. I uh, also we hit that 10 million mark last week, which is um, amazing subscribers. So um, thank you for subscribing, um, and have a wonderful weekend. I will see you next week or tomorrow morning when I release the next video.